It's true. Number one since Teddy Roosevelt. Who would have thought? Trump is the great environmentalist. The top of the tickets campaign in South Florida. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, I mean, they're just going to be an extraordinary uh, team. Congresswoman Donna Shalala, also a candidate, faces a rematch. Effective Monday, both Broward and Miami-Dade County uh, will be moved into phase two. South Florida gets the go-ahead to phase two. The Florida Keys take the opening with controversy. Let me be clear, the Miami-Dade County will not be opening up bars and nightclubs. We are still able to be more restrictive in Broward County. More business, a step closer to in-class schools. The uh, superintendent, uh, it is my responsibility. Miami-Dade's virtual school platform rescinded, replaced with changes going forward. It's all this week, this week in South Florida. Good morning, glad you could join us. I'm Michael Putney. I'm Glenna Milberg. We begin right there this hour with a sudden sea change that reversed Miami-Dade's disastrous start to virtual school and put some significant changes in place for the district going forward. At a marathon meeting of the school board, they took back control of spending for big educational contracts and they ordered the superintendent, Alberto Carvalho, to fix a long list of problems. The superintendent is with us today. You see him there on screen. Skype, Alberto, good morning. Good morning. Great to see you. Good morning. Nice yeah. to see you. Yeah, Superintendent, uh, for more than a decade under your leadership, the Miami-Dade Public Schools have had some tremendous successes in so many areas, but the last two weeks have been, I think, kindly, I could only say they have been a disaster. What do you have to say about this to parents, teachers, uh, students, and everybody else who really depend on the schools here? Well, you know, I certainly thank you, number one, for having me and thank you for acknowledging the tremendous success that Miami-Dade County Public Schools has had over the past, uh, quite frankly, 12 years. Uh, four years in a row, no F schools, three years in a row rated A, and uh, just the announcement this year's AP scores number one in the country. With that said, we ought to have the courage to celebrate our successes, but also acknowledge the challenges. We ventured into something that had never been done across the country at this level of magnitude. Why? Because parents and students uh, and teachers uh, were quite vocal in demanding a single sign-on platform uh, where all of the curriculum content, all of the applications would be signed. In the state of Florida, there are only about three such providers. Staff looked at those providers, one we had had bad experiences with in the past, that left two providers. We examined FLVS as well as K-12. K-12 uh, came up as a superior product, which by the way, we had had a contractual engagement with K-12 for the better part of 10 years. Why? Superintendent, I, I don't, uh, excuse me for interrupting. I know our short time together is such a good opportunity to really get into the news of the week uh, beyond the sound bites, which is why what we try to do here, specifically the news of the week this week was the school board suddenly in the middle of the night at their meeting uh, aborted K-12 because of what was going on for the past two weeks. They learned some what I perceive that to be uncomfortable details about a $15 million no bid contract that was given to them by the district without their oversight and there didn't need to be by the rules oversight at all. But I'm wondering why not take that kind of unprecedented, in your words, uh, expensive and uncomfortably detailed contract to the board? Why not it, for at very least for some political cover for you? Look, number one, nothing I ever do uh, is, is driven by politics or the necessity to cover politics. But it, hindsight is twenty twenty. Uh, all of the instructional technology procurement that we've done over the years, uh, multi-million dollar contracts, uh, have not been presented to the board. There are statutory exceptions. But look, uh, considering the level of implementation and potential implications, uh, probably we should have had a greater level of discussion with the board. Uh, we included uh, discussions about K-12 and what it looked like and the cost per child in our reopening plans to the board that was disclosed in public meetings, but we could have done more. You know, but the truth of the matter is K-12 overpromised, underdelivered. They've admitted that the issues that we faced were technical on their part, uh, engineering related, data migration problems. And I agree, 
uh, that uh, it was time for K-12 uh, to stop having a presence in Miami. Yeah, I uh, Mr. Superintendent, if I, if I could jump in here. Uh, early on Thursday morning after this 13-hour meeting, more than 400 speakers, Vice Chair Steve Gallen moved to amend the contract, and he said, let's give it a day so there is a transition period Teachers can get ready, new lesson plans, be on another platform. But suddenly at 741 on Thursday morning, your administration sent out an email to teachers uh, all across the district and said, there is no more my school online and adjust through the whole system, which was already chaotic, into really further chaos. Well, why did that happen? Well, the, uh, the revised the late night uh, revised amendment to the item put us in a really difficult position. Our plan going into that meeting was actually to provide for K-5 what we had done for 612, which was a voluntary access of the platform, but not mandatory. Uh, and we had gotten commitments from K-12 that they could do that at no cost. It was clear as the meeting unfolded that K-12 would not be in a position of uh, going on. And the language was interpreted both by K-12 and us as one that would end all liabilities, all interaction with K-12 actually by Friday. For that to happen, a lot of data migration would need to start before Friday. So it was interpreted that to reach a Friday finality of all engagement, you would need to uh, begin certain technological migration processes that could disrupt what was already a very, uh, a very less than stable condition. So the decision was made based on conversations with K-12 that announced a migration of student data that was disruptive to connectivity, um, effective uh, Thursday, and quickly default pivot to the one platform that teachers, students, parents have familiar, familiarity with that they had used in the spring of 2020 and that teachers had been trained for. And I recognize that there was yeah, but, a yeah, You know, uh, Alberto, excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt again. But, you know, it appears from what we have learned that not all teachers, in fact, in the Miami-Dade Public Schools were trained in Microsoft Teams or Zoom. Some were simply left in the lurch, had to I improvise. Can you, I can tell you a vast majority of teachers who were hired back in the spring, who were employees back in the spring, had been trained on Microsoft Teams or Zoom because those were the platforms of choice. The only protected platforms to actually access the portal and access the digital content. We recognize, uh, Michael and Glenna, that we may have hired, obviously, some teachers uh, over the summer that may not have had the level of familiarity. And that's why the resources for training are still there. Look, we would like to have done it in a more seamless way. We went into that meeting with a communications plan that would allow K-12 to remain active as an option. But again, based on uh, the decision at that time as interpreted by us in K-12, that would leave only until the 11th a possibility of an engagement. It's not just cutting the classes, it's cutting the classes and revert, migrate all the data back. And that was started Thursday. We wanted to prevent any additional disruption, even though we now know that for some teachers who may have had a relatively little familiarity with the platform, uh, they were impacted more than those uh, who could easily pivot uh, to that well-known platform. As we go forward, as the district goes forward, can you clear up for us? Uh, there, there is you, the district had put forth this three and a half pages of action items. Most of them have to do with cybersecurity and IT. The, frankly, many questions about why the district was not prepared, seeing as there have been audits about IT and, and money spent on shoring up that. But, but more specifically, going forward, you had in the past talked about first a, a switch at the company Cisco that was failing. And then the next day after that, that Tuesday, the second day of school, Comcast had issues with communications. Wednesday, there was a high school junior who was arrested for hacking in with a very simple program and a common program. Superintendent, were all of those things, did those really go wrong and, and were they fixed? And is Cisco and Comcast taking responsibility as much as K-12 has? Yes, so unfortunately, I'm here to tell you, and I, I am, uh, 
this job, this position, this responsibility, this community are important to me. Everything you just said is absolutely the truth. It is verifiable and it has been confirmed by the entities. So at no point was one element used to say, scapegoat any other element uh, of difficulty that we encountered. So on the very first day, uh, the very first thing that happened was a disruption of service of a very important switch. The switch was replaced. Uh, it failed again. It was determined by Cisco then that the problem was not the hardware. It was their own operating system that was corrupted. By Monday night, they had fixed it. By Tuesday morning, it was clear. But Monday morning, by the way, multiple calls from the district were made to Comcast because anytime there's a disruption of service specific to connectivity, you have to begin at the lowest level. Is this an internet problem? And Comcast responses to us were, no, the system seemed to be operating at normal capacity. Tuesday morning, we ran into the same problems. By Tuesday, Comcast actually sent us three emails uh, advising us that we were under attack and the day before the system had been attacked as well. So there was a compound problem. Which one led which one? Not really sure, even though the switch is responsible for the authentication of any user coming into the school system. So without that switch, you could not have connectivity anyway. So those were two separate problems. I believe by now that those two issues, unfortunately cloaked for a period of time, the other problems that we are experiencing with the K-12 platform. Yeah, uh, yep. Superintendent, uh, we are about out of time. I think it is just imperative that we hear you on the record about ki getting kids back in brick and mortar classrooms. I saw you there at the Frost Museum on Friday with the governor and the mayor, uh, and you said that it's possible within the next couple of weeks, September 30th had been your target date all along. How close are you going to, how close are you to getting kids back? Well, as I told you, uh, uh, Michael, I continue to believe that the place, best place for kids to be educated is the schoolhouse. We're going to be meeting with our experts, our public health and medical experts this week. We're going to have a special board meeting as well. And fortunately, the meeting with the public health experts uh, is after the public, the special uh, board meeting. But we want to run past them uh, all of the eight criteria, which are moving in the right direction. The positivity rate uh, is heading in the right direction, below 5% just yesterday. Mortality, morbidity, ICU bed capacity, everything is trending in the right direction. So with uh, the counties and the state's declaration of Miami-Dade moving to phase two, coupled now with the other 50%, which is important to us, which is the gating criteria that we follow as advised by these experts, I believe that uh, consistent with what I had informed the community of, which is by September 30th, we'll provide com uh, communication and a planned date for reopening. I believe that that now is the worst case scenario. I believe that we may be able to open schools uh, prior to September 30th, uh, based on the conditions that currently exist, but also well, based on the conversation with the board and our medical experts. Well, we will be following that closely as will half a million people who were involved in uh, Miami Dade Public Schools with parents, teachers, and uh, all the people who, you know, want the system to work. So, Superintendent, thanks for your time this morning. We appreciate it. Thank you. Next, as election season heats up, the Congresswoman and the candidate. Representative Donna Shalila is going to join us live. That's next. When she ran for Congress two years ago, Donna Shalala said, elect me, I'll be ready to go on day one. Boy, was she ready. Well, two <laughs> years later, the Congresswoman has an incumbent's record to run on as she faces a rematch from the same Republican opponent in an election year dominated by the pandemic experience. Congresswoman Shalala, former UM president, former HHS secretary for President Clinton, joins us right now from her spot in the 26th Congressional District, which comprises Coral Gables up through downtown Miami and southern Miami Beach. Congresswoman, great to see you. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. And Great let to us, see you. you know, let me admit and air, you are the congresswoman in the 27th congressional district, and that was my air, so I apologize to my colleague. I, uh, I read it, so I'll take, <laughs> I'll take just as equal <laughs> response. Anyway, congresswoman, we're glad to see you. 
Um, on Tuesday, Joe Biden is going to finally campaign in Florida. Will you campaign with him? Uh, no, because I'll be in Washington. Uh, we're going to Washington tomorrow because uh, we need to finish this part of the session and hopefully um, it will be the beginning of negotiations with the Republicans uh, to try to do something about helping people in our community. We are really hurting in this community. We need to extend unemployment. We need to get money for the teachers, for the schools, for the hospitals. And uh, we certainly need to help our small businesses if they're going to open. Um, I heard the superintendent, he needs resources to change structurally the way those schools um, are organized. And the state needs resources if it's going to help us pay teachers and police officers and, and fire officers. Uh, we've just got to find a way to compromise and um, uh, to come back with literally the taxpayers' money. Congresswoman, while we're on the, the campaign, um, Vice President Joe Biden is making a trip to Florida this week. Kamala Harris was here in Miami-Dade this week. As polls show a little bit of a struggling in Miami-Dade Hispanic community uh, in particular, what do you make of that very sliver, an important sliver of the race so far? Nothing. It's so early and uh, we're just starting to make our cases. Now I've been making my case for a long time uh, with the Hispanic community and obviously I represent a different district that's 70% Hispanic. Joe Biden will make a very clear case. Look, I don't run into a Cuban woman that isn't upset about this president taking children out of the arms of their mothers. Uh, we've got a long way to go to make our case Voting is going to start at the end of this month, so I'm pleased that Joe is coming in. Kamala, was she was here and uh, had a big impact on the groups that she met with. Uh, um, and so you're going to see a lot of the Biden-Harris campaign, and all of us are going to be working hard for them at the same time. Yeah, Congresswoman, we have learned uh, that Michael Bloomberg, the former New York mayor candidate for president, briefly is going to give the Biden campaign a hundred million dollars for Florida. Boy, that's a big chunk of change. Um, will that, how much difference is that going to make? It will make a difference in getting our message out. It will mean that we'll dominate uh, television and radio in both Spanish and English. Um, and um, it'll, it'll give Joe Biden a, an opportunity to be very clear about his differences with the current president. Yeah, but you know, you know, Mr. Biden is fighting something that, in fact, has been raised in your campaign, true or not. But the candidates, Maria Alvira Salazar, who's running against you again, who will be a guest on this program, she says that uh, that you and Joe Biden and the uh, Democrats are all radical leftists. You are socialist and that you are sort of too close to all the radical or very left wing members of the Democratic Party, like AOC or Ilhan Omar. What's your response to that? It's ridiculous. Um, no one could be more of a capitalist than me. No candidate that's running for office in South Florida has created more jobs than I've created. Uh, I'm a pragmatic capitalist. I also believe in Medicare and Social Security and the Affordable Care Act. I have the largest enrollment in the Affordable Care Act of any congressional district in the country. Those are not socialist policies. They're policies that both Democrats and Republicans support. Um, and I think charging us with things like socialism is just, it's just silly. It makes no sense. And if you look at our records, it makes absolutely no sense. And it will go down the toilet the way the rest of their charges will. Congresswoman, to, to your point, COVID, the pandemic has really, is really overshadowing the election in every race. Uh, interesting that you can talk as uh, from the perspective of a former HHS secretary. This week, we heard the tapes from the Bob Woodward book coming out on President Trump about how the president knew that the pandemic was much more serious in the U.S. early on than he let on. He said he wanted to take the leadership position of calming a jittery public. From, from your perspective as that cabinet member, can you address that? I certainly can. First of all, he blamed the Chinese for not telling us early enough. Now we find out the president of the United States 
knew and didn't tell the American people. This, this, this is more than a cover-up. This is part of a narrative from this president. It turns out it starts with him hiding information from the American public dangerously, recklessly, that resulted in unnecessary deaths. And it goes into him stepping on the public health message, refusing to accept the fact that people ought to wear masks and social distance, even last night at his rallies. Is uh, there no one has gone. And, and it's a narrative about a reckless president who is responsible for lying to the American people. And when he lies, people die. And the American people are catching on to all of this. Is, is there any validity, generally speaking, in a leader taking a, a much more calm and comforting tone? Is there, is there validity in that kind of leadership in this situation? As long as they're clear about the facts. I did an op-ed at uh, the end of February that basically said the responsibility of leadership is to give people the facts and the strategy, the program, the, uh, the plan. But you've got to be honest with people about what the facts are. Combine that with calmness, no question about it. But you don't hide the facts, you don't hide information from the American people that could save lives. This is about life and death. And he has laid it out in a way that simply is shocking. Yeah, uh, Congresswoman, uh, here besides the Bob Woodward stunning revelations about what the president knew and what he didn't tell the American people, then on top of that this week, you had the Atlantic article still reverberating about calling veterans, uh, military veterans, and men who had fought and died in World War II losers. Uh, and yet, uh, President Trump is at 48% in Florida, tied with Joe Biden. Why do you think these criticisms and these revelations, you know, aren't getting more play or, or, or being taken seriously by Trump supporters? We'll see on Election Day. You know, two members of my family have been killed in Americans' wars. Every generation of my family has served uh, in the military. Um, they... My uncles who died in World War II were not suckers and they were not losers. And every family that had a family member that served heard that and it hit them directly in their hearts. Uh, that, that's more than reckless. That's evil for the President of the United States to say things like that about our military. Uh, we revere those who, who passed by defending our peace, um, by giving us opportunities. Um, and it's just, it's unacceptable and it will come out in the course of the campaign. But for those of us who have lost family members, my grandmother kept those two gold stars on her window until the day she died in the 1970s. She wanted everyone to know how much of a sacrifice that our family had made. Um, it is really disgusting that he would say something like that. Congresswoman, in the short time we have together, I know this week you were in Miami for an event to bring awareness to climate change. A couple of days before that, the president was in Jupiter signing this executive order, extending the moratorium on offshore drilling, actually expanding it, and uh, calling himself the number one environmental <laughs> president since Teddy Roosevelt. And I wonder if you would weigh in on that for us. <laughs> you know, he signed an executive order. We had already signed a bill. Republicans and Democrats in Florida came together to ban offshore drilling forever, forever. He signs an executive, and we begged the Senate to pass the bill, and we begged the president to sign the bill. So he comes in during election time, signs a temporary executive order, one that he can reverse, which the administration months ago said that they would reverse any decisions about offshore drilling. I mean, how cynical can you possibly be? You know, we well, also passed with bipartisan support uh, TPS for Venezuelans, and we cannot get him to act. Watch. Let's see if 
this election gets really close, whether he comes and finally signs an executive order. Well, there, I would there, there are some that would say, however, however it gets there, it gets there. <laughs> Congresswoman, great to see you. Appreciate your time this morning. Thank you Thanks. very much, Congresswoman. Great to see you. Well, the Florida Keys is just one day away from lifting some of its most stringent pandemic restrictions. But not everyone is all on board with that, including the county mayor. Heather Carruthers is live with us. The Florida Keys took a bad beating this weekend from Tropical Storm Sally, and they've also taken a beating in the last six months for their tourism-based economy by COVID-19. Monroe County makes health and safety decisions independent from neighboring South Florida counties and will again tomorrow as it lifts some COVID-related restrictions. Monroe County Mayor Heather Crothers is with us live from Key West. Good morning, Mayor. I know you were on the losing end of a very close three to two vote about lifting curfew and lifting restrictions on alcohol sales. Tell us about that. Well, we had after uh, in, in advance of our lobster mini season decided to uh, halt alcohol sales between midnight and 5 a.m. Um, we thought that that was prudent given the information that we had had from our health department about where it seemed some of the cases that we were seeing were coming from. As you probably know, that, that since uh, we lifted our checkpoint, we have had about 1,600 cases when we had only 100 cases before that. Mm. Um, so we had uh, decided to do that. That expired on September 8th and we had a discussion about whether or not to extend it. I had thought since schools in the county are going to be in person as of this Monday, and because it usually takes about two weeks after you see an influx of, uh, of uh, activity for cases to actually show up, that perhaps we should wait two weeks to do that um, to li before we lifted that to make sure that we did have this under control. Um, but you know, it's a, it's a democracy and it was a three to two vote, so that's where we are today. Yeah, well, we all believe in democracy. The majority does rule. On the other hand, it sounds like you are feeling, I'm getting the sense that you feel that maybe uh, the keys of Monroe County uh, is rushing a little bit, a little bit premature to be moving this fast. The bars are open, liquor stores are selling. I mean, you want your economy to succeed. We all do. But, uh, uh, you know, you, some people are being put at risk. Some people are going to be put at risk forever with this until we have a, a, a viable vaccine that can be widely distributed. And I think that that's just the reality that we need to learn how to live with it. You know, our marker has always been uh, hospitalizations. We have our hospitalizations, it seems, under control right now. Um, you know, having said that, there have been a couple of actions within the last couple of weeks that have changed sort of the mix of how we control the disease. One of which is we had uh, Labor Day, a lot of people in town for Labor Day. Um, we are, we've lifted the curfew uh, as of the governor's DBPR order on Thursday night. Uh, bars are now allowed to, to operate at 50% capacity. Um, and schools are gonna be in person and in session as of Monday. So, I, you know, I, I had hoped that we would give it another two weeks to see if we do in fact have it under control, but you know, we're a flexible organization and if it turns out that we start seeing a big spike in the cases, we'll have to roll those back. You know, you know I'm not in favor of the yo-yo effect for businesses either, but um, you know, that will we'll respond as is appropriate. Yeah, that's, that's really tough. I think a lot of us in South Florida are gonna be watching opening of schools tomorrow, you know, compared yeah. to Miami-Dade and Broward school districts, I believe there's what, like 12 campuses, 5,000 plus students, so much smaller. And yet yeah. the brick and mortar schools are just the same. Do you um, tell us about how, how this is gonna work and really you'll be a test case for the rest of South Florida, it sounds like. How are those kids gonna, and teachers gonna be able to do this tomorrow? Well, I think our school district has taken extreme precautions. They have uh, created social distancing within classes. They have all kinds of precautions in terms of how kids get to and from their school. Um, and uh, you know, I, I have a lot of confidence in, in that they've done everything they can to be able to operate safely. But, you know, kids are kids, um, and time will tell. Yeah. Uh, Mayor Carruthers, give us a quick weather report. I mean, I saw that at one point late yesterday or last night, 
Key West had four inches of rain in one hour. I know that you had something like 11 inches. Uh, yeah. Has Have your streets cleared up? You know, how, how soggy uh, are you down there? Uh, we're pretty soggy. Um, you know, there are some areas that we've seen some significant street flooding. It started to uh, recede now, um, you know, but I'm a little concerned because we have, what, 60, 70 percent chance of rain uh, starting later this afternoon again. So... You know, we're, we're very concerned. We'd like people to, to stay home as much as they can. Don't drive through that. It's bad for your car, and it creates wakes that can, it can impact neighboring uh, uh, properties. So, um, you know, it, it's wet. It's, that's, that's all I can say. It's pretty wet. <laughs> all right, Mayor Heather Carruthers, we always enjoy speaking with you. Thank you for the firsthand weather report from Key West. That's, a, that's <laughs> the simplest weather report ever. It's wet. Back it's to you. <laughs> Thanks, Mayor. Election season in South Florida adds that political spin to every breaking news item of the week. And we're going to take a closer look at some of the week's top stories with our roundtable. Yeah, it's back, and that is next. Prior to the pandemic, our weekly roundtable was a regular and popular part of this program. Spontaneous, unscripted discussion of the week's top news stories. And we're bringing it back today <laughs> in the new normal virtual way with our two roundtable veterans. Raquel Rocky Rodriguez is former general counsel to Governor Jeb Bush, now managing partner at Buchanan, Ingersoll and Rooney, and recently tapped to chair the law firm's Florida offices. Chris Smith is an attorney in Fort Lauderdale with the Trip Scott firm. He's a former Democratic state senator and representative and is so great to have you both here with us sure today. Sure is. Chris Rocky, great to see you. Chris Smith, let great me begin. Be Thank you. Uh, Chris, let me great ask you, uh, this week, Tuesday, I guess, in Jupiter, President uh, Trump was there, called himself the environmental president, greatest environmental president since Teddy Roosevelt, which might be a bit of a stretch, but he, but he, but he did sign this executive order for a decade of guaranteeing no offshore oil drilling on either Florida coast. And there are a lot of people who really uh, appreciate that and want that. What difference uh, is this going to make in the election? Well, I think people are going to see through it, that he's had four years to actually do legislation to change this. And he's had four years to sign, as um, Congresswoman Shalala said, real action by doing an executive order shows that, you know, December 1, he can rescind that executive order. It's clearly seen as a political stunt and the last minute to try and get some of those environmental water voters. His administration, the Department of Interior, has talked for three and a half years about allowing more drilling for gas and drilling for oil. And now that he's looking at the polls, he's seeing that maybe I need a reverse course, but by doing an executive order, it's not permanent. He can change it, and we've seen this president change his mind on a drop of a dime. So, Rocky, actually, when the administration was looking to expand drilling, then Governor Rick Scott convinced the, the president to take Florida out of that mix. So, so what's wrong with an elected official doing what its constituents want? There's absolutely nothing wrong with it, Glenna. And, uh, yeah, you know, uh, presidents and others have the prerogative to change their mind. This president maybe changes his mind more often and more quickly than others. But I want to clear up uh, two misconceptions. Number one, we have had a ban on drilling in the uh, Florida uh, area of the Gulf of Mexico since 2006 with legislation that President George W. Bush signed. Now, that legislative ban is going to expire in 2022. In addition, uh, the, the president's executive order, people commonly think that it can be rescinded on the drop of the dime, but there was recently a federal decision that held that President Trump could not rescind President Obama's prior executive orders on other kinds of environmental issues without going through a very thorough administrative process. So it is not as easy to rescind executive orders in this area as people are saying. Yeah, and it would pro probably be political folly to turn right around and, and rescind it. Let's move on, if we can, to the uh, 11th court, uh, Circuit Court of Appeal in Atlanta yeah. this week uh, issued a really significant ruling 
overturning the trial court judge on Amendment 4, the right of ex-felons to vote, Chris Smith. Uh, this is a huge disappointment <clears throat> for about 800,000 former felons yes. who had been counting on voting in November. Now they won't be able to. Yeah, this is something I worked on in the legislature, and I talked to you guys as a member of the Constitutional Revision Commission. Something I thought Florida took a significant step on, allowing these almost million voters who have served their time, who have done what's necessary to vote. And for the 11th Circuit to go back and, you know, sort of ratify what we called a poll tax um, for people to be able to vote, it was disheartening. It's going to be significant in the Florida election by by um, voting out those voters. I think, you know, razors in a state like Florida, those voters will be significant. And it was disheartening that the voice of Florida, those over 60% of Floridians that voted to allow those people to vote for the 11th Circuit to do that is real disheartening. And we hope, and then I know there's appeals, I hope we can do something in the future to allow the voice of Floridians to let those people vote, vote. You know, we always, we've been talking about this, to your point, so much, and we always yes. manage to talk about it in sort of a partisan sense. But we've met so many former felons who are Republican <clears throat> voters. Why, why is there this sense that the people who now are blocked because of financial issues from regaining these voting rights are would be overwhelmingly Democrat? Rocky? I don't or Chris, well, uh, jump in, just, round table, you, you get to jump pointed, in. <laughs> you just pointed out something that's very important. You know, the, the Florida legislature was not picking one side or the other. It wasn't race-based, it wasn't partisan-based. It was implementing what the voters actually voted for. What did Amendment 4 say? You had to complete all terms of your sentence forever. Terms of sentence have included fines, penalties, and restitution. There was never... This is not a poll tax, this is a penalty. And what the, the 11th Circuit did, it wasn't just consistent with what the voters voted in 2018, it was, it's consistent with the U.S. Constitution. They, they uh, were supposed to defer to the judgment of the legislature. There's a rational reason for requiring people to pay the restitution and the fines that are part of their sentence. This is part of the reentry into society after you have broken the social compact. Over 30 other states have conditions for uh, fel people who are convicted of felons to be able to vote. Florida is no different. I, I don't really think it's, uh, and it, this is, you know, we've banned felons completely since before Florida became uh, a state, since before the Civil War. And so yeah. this is a long time policy of the state. And to say you have to have all or nothing and you can't have a midway point where people are uh, required to re-enter society by complying with its rules, I don't think is unconstitutional. And I think the 11th We're Circuit got it exactly right. Can, can I just point out, We're Chris, there is, yeah. in Miami-Dade County, and we've had the state attorney and the public defender on this program, they've created yeah. this sort of rocket docket where they actually yeah. go and help those people get a plan for payment that then right. allows it. It's a really interesting role yeah. model program. Has and that been picked others. up anywhere else? Well, you've had others like LeBron James and other athletes who have now stepped forward financial services to help, help these people. Um, and, and yeah, this was before Civil War. There was a lot of stuff before Civil War that we actually changed well, because that's, it's the right you know, thing Love LeBron, but he this can't the change right the law. Right. LeBron James no, no, can't do what the state attorney people, does. <laughs> to help the if, people if I can jump in though. here, you know, um, there is uh, the, the uh, Desmond Meads group, uh, the Florida mm -hmm. uh, Rights Restoration Coalition does have a program to help people uh, find out what their fines are. And there's uh, lawyers working pro bono on this. I'm very proud to say that my firm, uh, Buchanan, Ingersoll and Rooney, is part of this coalition that is helping people find out what their fines are and um, and and help them comply so that they can actually register to vote. So I applaud LeBron James for for using his wealth and his efforts. I think that it's perfectly uh, wonderful. And in fact, I think as part of uh, civil society, we should be helping others comply with the requirements to vote. But right. you know, the law is the law, 
and we have to comply with it. But now it's up yeah. to us as citizens to help people comply with it so they can register. All right. Well, we're going to talk about yeah. one other <laughs> okay. aspect of the law, which was yes. Renatha Francis is not going to be a member yes. of the Florida Supreme Court. We'll talk more uh, with the roundtable about that when we come back. Welcome back. We are in the midst of a very good roundtable with Rocky Rodriguez and Chris Smith, friends of the roundtable for a long time. Uh, Rocky Rodriguez, let me ask you about this situation with Circuit Judge Renatha Francis. She had been nominated by the governor to be a Supreme Court justice, uh, but the state Supreme Court late this week sent the governor an order saying she is not qualified, name somebody else because she has not been a member of the Florida Bar for 10 years and would not be until September 24th. You, you, know, you would think that the governor's counsel would have done a better job of vetting her before he named her. I don't think it's a question of vetting. I, and I think it was very well known that she had not yet reached 10 years in practice. I think it was a, a difference in analyzing when is it that the uh, a justice uh, to actually takes office and when does that qualification apply? In of elections, a, a judge elected has to be eligible as, as the date of the election. So I think that probably the legal analysis that the governor's office was engaged in and the Florida Supreme Court had a different take on it Rocky, your your signal is breaking up a little bit. The day bit. that the governor announced the appointment. Let's, let's try to get your signal in locked she, in a little bit. Breaking up. Chris Smith, uh, <laughs> go ahead and jump in here. I'll because... gladly jump in. Here's the problem with what happened this week. Um, as a African-American male, one of the things I've experienced throughout my life is the, the stereotyping of affirmative action hires. And what the governor was doing was making a caricature, caricature and making... Um, the stereotype of affirmative action higher, that we needed diversity on the court. I fought for that for many years. People like Perry Thurston, Bobby DuBose, Keone McGee fought for diversity on the court. And what the governor was doing was creating diversity on the court, but with someone who wasn't technically qualified. I know Judge Francis, she's a great jurist, she's a great lawyer, but under the rules of the court, she was not qualified. So for him to appoint her, when she's not qualified, is buying into the caricature or the stereotypes of an affirmative action hire. There are many great African-American jurors throughout this state that he could have chosen from or to try to get through the JQC. And it was just an unfortunate situation where the governor tried to do a good thing and tried to do the right thing, but it's ironic that he was buying into and playing into what we've experienced for years, and that's the stereotype or the caricature of an affirmative action hire. Chris, should we I, not be should we not I, be looking at the actual judicial nominating commission? Who yeah. he's yes, he needs to definitely. pick from that list, yes. and that list was not diverse at yeah. all. I gotta Correct. I gotta jump in Correct. here. I I don't think the governor was motivated by any caricature. Uh, uh, judge Francis is is well known as a very thoughtful judge. She's had a stellar career. Yes, um, she's, she had mm -hmm. been in practice less, less than 10 years, but um, t that aside, she ticked every box for having the and call. I, and I said that. I, I agree. I agree 100%. I, don't want to, I do not want to disparage Judge Francis. I think she's a great choice for the Supreme Court. But what we've experienced for decades is that an affirmative action hire is not qualified. They do not meet the qualifications. And under the Supreme Court and under our Constitution, and under our rules, she did not meet the qualifications and what he would have done is contribute to that caricature right. i know he did not chris, want to do that chris he wanted Rocky, to do the right we, thing th this this discussion is not over i'm <laughs> we sure we just didn't leave enough time <laughs> our but, fault but, our bad but we are out of time thank you very much for a really great discussion great to see you both great. thanks thank for having you. me on this week stay tuned we'll be right back We thank you so much for being here with us today. Remember, we're online 24-7 at local10.com. And stay informed, get involved. Go Dolphins! <laughs>